We begin tonight with Flight 370. The major new clue was it deliberately brought down. Right now, in the middle of the Indian Ocean, a high tech ship is launching an army of underwater robots. What could have caused this tragedy right under our noses? In an era when we have the internet, satellite, radar communication, it just disappears off the radar screen. They are heading to a new search area, a tiny box of ocean that has never been scanned. Why? Because a brilliant engineer finally cracked the code. He used a ghost network of radio signals to find the true location of MH370, a location that the data has been pointing to for 10 years. The official searches were looking in the wrong place. This time, they believe they are going straight to the wreckage. Think of WSPR like a giant invisible spider web stretched around the whole globe. Each thread is one of those weak signals, moving back and forth between two stations. Most of the time, it just helps hobbyists figure out how far their signals travel. But Godfrey realized something big. If a huge 500,000 pound metal airplane slices through one of those threads, it leaves a disturbance. It acts like a digital tripwire. It doesn't sound dramatic. It might just be a tiny dip in the signal strength or a little shift in frequency. But here's the kicker. Those disturbances get logged every single time in a massive online database called WSPRNet. And that database is huge. Years worth of data, billions of little tweets from radios all around the world. Godfrey thought if MH370 really flew across the Indian Ocean that night, it must have crossed dozens of those invisible threads. And if he could find those disturbances, he might be able to map the plane's path like a trail of breadcrumbs. So he rolled up his sleeves and started digging. This wasn't a weekend project, it became his obsession. For three years, he combed through the WSPRNet archive, which meant dealing with more than 200 billion lines of raw data. He had to build custom software just to filter out all the false alarms, things like solar storms, background interference, or the normal chaos of the ionosphere. He was looking for a single plane shadow in a hurricane of noise, and then slowly a picture started to form. On the night between March 7th and March 8th of 2014, when the Boeing 777 disappeared, Godfrey found roughly 1 130 WSPR anomalies over the Indian Ocean. Not random noise, not explainable by weather. When he plotted them on a map in the order they happened, they lined up into a track. The track began right where Malaysian military radar had last picked up the plane. From there, it curved southwest, then turned south. It almost perfectly matched the path suspected by the Inmarsat data, but with one huge difference, it was a line, not a giant 100-mile wide arc. And the trail didn't just fade away. It ended at a very specific spot, 29.128 degrees south, 99.934 degrees east. That's about 1,500 kilometers west of Perth, Australia. It's deep water, yes, but here's the wow factor. It's a spot about 200 kilometers outside the official search area. They had missed it. For the first time in years, someone had produced a brand new data-driven location for MH370. Not a vague guess. A single point backed up by hard numbers that had been sitting there, hidden, for almost a decade. But a bunch of squiggles on a chart isn't proof. Godfrey had to prove his idea wasn't just science fiction. The objections collapse. Here's the thing about any bold new idea. The moment you put it out there, people are going to push back. And with something as haunting and emotionally loaded as MH370, the skepticism was instant and loud. So let's walk through the biggest objections people threw at Richard Godfrey's WSPR theory. The first objection hit almost immediately. WSPR was never designed for this purpose. And you know what? That's true. WSPR was never built to track lost airplanes. But here's the twist. Science is full of tools being used in ways the inventors never dreamed of. Think about it. X-rays were discovered by accident. Penicillin? Total fluke when a scientist noticed mold in a Petri dish. Even GPS, which we now use to find coffee, was originally a military navigation system. So yeah, WSPR wasn't built to find planes. But the physics behind it, the way radio waves bend and scatter when something big slices through them, that's solid decades-old science. And Godfrey didn't just stop at theory, he went for a real-world test. 
This is the ultimate wow factor. His team teamed up with folks at the University of Liverpool and chartered a real Boeing 777. They flew it along the very corridor over the Indian Ocean that matched the suspected MH370 route. Meanwhile, WSPR stations around the world were listening. And guess what? Right on cue, the disturbances popped up. The tripwires went off exactly where the plane was. Not sort of near it, not vaguely around the same time. The spikes matched the aircraft's position almost to the minute. That was the smoking gun proof that this system worked in real time. The second objection sounded more like a jab at Godfrey himself. He keeps moving the target. And again, on the surface, that's true. His first calculations years ago pointed to a crash site closer to 33 degrees south. Then it shifted. Then it shifted again to 29 degrees south. Critics pounced, saying it looked like guesswork. But here's the thing. In science, changing your answer as you get better data isn't failure, it's progress. When Copernicus first said the Earth wasn't the center of the universe, his math wasn't perfect. It took later astronomers to refine it. Same deal here. Each shift happened because more WSPR data came online and the software analyzing it got smarter. The area of uncertainty shrank. And here's the kicker. For over 14 straight months, the target hasn't budged from 29 degrees south. That stability is what convinced people this wasn't just a moving goalpost. Then there's the third objection, the one nobody can argue away completely. We still haven't found wreckage at that exact spot. Fair point. Until someone actually pulls a black box off the seabed, it's all still theory. But let's flip it around. Instead of starting with the theory, start with the debris we already have. Remember the flapperon that washed up on Réunion Island in 2015? And the other bits that turned up in Mozambique and Madagascar? That's hard evidence. So where did they come from? That's where oceanographers stepped in. At the GEOMAR, Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research in Germany, scientists ran massive drift simulations. They basically dropped hundreds of thousands of virtual message-in-a-bottle trackers into computer models of the Indian Ocean currents. Then they reversed the drift paths. They worked backward from Réunion and the African coast. They asked the computer, where would this trash have to start to end up here? Something remarkable happened. The majority of the drift paths traced back to an origin point within about 100 kilometers of Godfrey's hotspot at 29 degrees south. This is the most important part of the entire story. You have two completely independent high-tech methods. One is radio wave analysis. The other is ocean current analysis, and they both point to the exact same tiny patch of ocean that the official search never scanned. The data is in, the proof is solid, so what are we doing about it? No fine, no fee. This is where the story stops being about the past and starts being about right now. For more than a decade, the story of MH370 has been one of frustration. It's been a story of dead ends, false hopes, and agonizing silence. We've been stuck in a loop of what-ifs and maybes. We've heard wild theories ranging from alien abduction to secret spy plots. We've seen massive, expensive, government-funded searches scan thousands of square miles of the ocean floor and find absolutely nothing. The trail went cold almost immediately, leaving the world with the single greatest aviation mystery of all time. But today, right now, that is changing. For the first time in years, this isn't just talk. This isn't just a new theory. There is action. The company at the center of all this is named Ocean Infinity. If that name rings a bell, it's because they are the deep sea titans who led the last massive search effort back in 2018. They are, to put it simply, the best in the world at finding things lost in the abyss. Back then, they spent 90 days scanning a massive patch of the Southern Indian Ocean. They came up empty. But here's what you need to understand. They weren't wrong. They were just looking in the wrong place. They were still following the old vague satellite data, those pings that gave a search area the size of a country. It was like trying to find a set of car keys in all of North America. But that 2018 search wasn't a total failure. It was a training ground. Ocean Infinity built up an arsenal of deep sea technology that has only gotten better, smarter, and faster. And now they're back. This isn't a proposal. This isn't a maybe. 
As of 2025, the Malaysian government has officially greenlit a brand new contract with Ocean Infinity. The search is on. So what's different this time? Why go back to a place that yielded nothing? Because they aren't going back to the same place. They have a new target, a new search zone. This time, it's a carefully defined 15,000 square kilometer box. And where did this magic box come from? It came from the groundbreaking WSPR analysis by British aerospace engineer Richard Godfrey. He's the man who figured out that the plane's path was recorded in a global web of amateur radio signals, a digital tripwire it crossed again and again. His data pinpoints a hotspot that was just outside the 2018 search. They were so close, but here is the single biggest wow factor of all. This is the part that should make the hair on your neck stand up. The deal is no fine, no fee. Let's be crystal clear about what that means. Ocean Infinity is paying for everything up front. This isn't a government blank check. Ocean Infinity is footing the bill for the ship, the millions of dollars in fuel, the highly paid crew of specialists, and the most advanced fleet of underwater robots on the planet. The total cost is estimated to be around $70 million. They are gambling $70 million of their own money, and they only get a single cent if they actually find the wreck. You do not make that kind of bet unless you are incredibly confident in the data. This isn't just a business deal, it's a statement. It means Ocean Infinity, the world's number one deep sea search company, believes Richard Godfrey is right. They are betting their entire reputation and a mountain of cash that his WSPR data is the key. So what are they bringing to the fight? Their flagship is the Armada 7806. This isn't just a boat, it's a floating high-tech command center. It's a 300-foot-long mothership for a fleet of robots. And it's carrying an army of underwater robots called Hugen Autonomous Underwater Vehicles, or AUVS. Forget everything you think you know about underwater drones. These aren't little tethered cameras you fly with a joystick. These are 20-foot-long, multi-million-dollar robotic submarines. They are sleek yellow torpedoes of pure technology. They can dive to 6,000 meters. That's almost four miles down. This is a place of eternal darkness where the pressure is over 8,000 pounds per square inch, a force that would crush a normal submarine like a tin can. These Hugens don't need tethers. They are completely autonomous. They are launched from the Armada and descend into the blackness, where they can roam for days at a time, running pre-programmed search patterns. They are essentially a pack of robotic hunting wolves for the deep. They mow the lawn, flying just above the seabed, scanning every single inch of the ocean floor with the most advanced side-scan sonar ever built. This sonar is so detailed it can see in the dark and spot a car wreck, a shipping container, or the debris field of a Boeing 777 under miles of water. Now let's talk numbers. This is where the hope becomes real. A single Hugena UV can cover about 500 square kilometers of brutal terrain every single day. The Armada isn't launching one, it's launching an entire fleet of them. With all of them running around the clock 24-7, they can methodically sweep the entire 15,000 square kilometer search box in about one month. Think about that. More than a decade of frustration. More than 10 years of dead ends, false hopes, and painful anniversaries. And now the answer might be just days away. As we speak, a high-tech war room is floating above the most precise search area we have ever had. Analysts are staring at data streams, watching as these robots paint a picture of a place no human has ever seen. So here we are. After all these years of heartbreak and wild theories, the pieces are finally, finally lining up. We have solid, independently verified data that has withstood every skeptical attack. We have a defined, manageable target, and we have the most advanced deep sea technology on the planet heading straight for it, backed by a $70 million bet that says it's there. The known all along part of this story isn't some wild conspiracy about a government cover up, it's the heartbreaking reality that the data, the digital breadcrumbs, were always there, hidden in plain sight, buried in the noise of amateur radio logs from around the world. We just needed one brilliant, stubborn engineer to finally look in the right place. People watching this are looking for a mystery, and for 10 years, this has been the biggest one. But is this all true? Is it too good to be true? Are we missing a key detail? 
The thing is, for the 239 families who lost someone on that flight, this isn't a mystery. It's not a TV show. It's a wound that is never, ever closed. It's a decade of ambiguity, of not knowing whether to mourn. And this mission right now is their last, best hope for an answer. Not for a theory, an answer. It's been over a decade. But was the answer hidden in plain sight? Click like, subscribe, and tell us in the comments. Do you think this is finally the end of the search for MH370?